Well, amen. Thank you guys so much for leading us in song. Good morning to everybody. It is good to see all of you uh, this morning. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and just hold on to them. Typically, I would uh, give you the text that we're going to be camping in, but we're actually going to be jumping around a little bit this morning, and so I just want to encourage you to hold on, and I'll guide you out along as we go. Let me ask you a question. How many of you guys this morning uh, made your bed before you came to church? Okay, like four of you. All right, great. Did Tyler, you did not make your bed. Put your hand down, all right? <laughs> Uh, look, it's okay, no shame, no guilt for, for any of you who didn't. I really struggle with this whole bed-making thing. I have my entire life. And, and I struggle with making my bed not because it's incredibly difficult. All right, I, I know how to make a bed. It's not hard. And I struggle making it not because it takes a long time. It, you can make your bed in but a few moments. I struggle because I just don't see the point. All right? Uh, at least until this morning and uh, something I read this morning. But I normally just don't understand, what is the point of making the bed? Because I'm just going to get in it later tonight. You know, I'm going to mess it up again. I don't see the point. And so because of that, I don't do it. But then I read this this morning from um, a very powerful and strong man, Admiral, uh, Admiral William McRaven. He was talking about the importance of making your bed. He gave this in a speech to some uh, graduates from the Naval Academy. He was talking about his time as a, a SEAL, training to be a Navy SEAL. And he said, every morning we had to get up and we had to make our bed. And I thought that was so ridiculous. I thought that, well, what's the point? You know, we're training to be soldiers to go out. What, why make your bed? But then he said, but I realized that if you want to change the world, you need to make your bed. That's a big statement, right? He goes on to explain. He says this. He says, if you make your bed every morning, you will have, have accomplished the first task of the day. And if you will give you, it will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement to tomorrow will be better. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. I don't know about you, but I'm inspired to get up tomorrow morning and make my bed. I'm sure my wife will hold me accountable to that, all right? And we need to know the point before we're going to do something, right? And if we're asked to do something, we don't understand why we're asked to do it. Well, then it's really difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to find motivation to do it. And it is for that reason that we have decided that it would be really beneficial for us as a church to take the first few weeks at the beginning of the school year to just talk about who we are as a church, who God has called us to be, what he has called us to do. So we're going to be taking the next six Sundays to do a vision series here at Alathe. Now we've done a lot of these over the last 10 years, but we haven't done one in a while. Our original plan was to kick off the book of Genesis. By the way, we're still going to do that. That's, that's our plan after we finish this series. But we felt it was really important for us to refresh ourselves on the vision that God has called us to. So I know it's been a bit, for, but for our members, can someone yell out the three words that kind of encapsulate our vision? One? Yeah, cultivate, engage, restore. Dana was on that because Dana's been here a long time. She's sit through a lot of vision series over the years. Cultivate, engage, and restore. We want to be, we feel like God has called us to be a people who cultivate biblical community, who engage our world with the good news of Jesus Christ, and to be those who work to restore our city all, by the way, for the glory of God and for our eternal enjoyment of the Son, Jesus Christ. And we do those things for God's glory and that we might bask in and enjoy the Lord Jesus Christ together. So this morning, we're going to look at the first element. We're going to look at cultivating biblical community. And we, we, we talk about this a lot at, at, at our church. You'll hear us talking about community and the importance of a lot. And we're going to challenge you in a couple ways. This is just preliminary stuff here, okay? But we're going to challenge you in a couple ways. Uh, that will help you to cultivate biblical community. So two clear ways that we as a church will encourage you to do that is, number one, uh, we, we will talk about membership a lot. All right, so Brian sat up here and talked about the table class, right? Uh, and we, we believe that membership is important. And in the co postmodern culture that we live in, I don't think membership is very trendy at all. A lot of people have bucked the idea altogether, but we believe it to be a very biblical idea. 
And so we're going to teach and encourage membership because we care about you. And we think it is for the good of your soul to join a church, not just kind of hang around and hover around a church. And we'll see in a moment that our union with Christ includes union with his people. And the scriptures pictures us, right? What is one of the metaphors of the church? It's a body that is conjoined together. So we're going to talk about membership and we'll give you opportunities like the table class to uh, pursue that. Number two, we all, always highlight our community groups. And you'll hear us talk about our community groups and say something like, they are the lifeblood of our church. Now, that is not in any way meant to diminish Sunday mornings. Uh, we believe Sunday mornings is crucial to the health of our church. It is crucial that you come and hear the preaching and teaching of God's Word weekly together. It is here together as one church body that we do the sacraments of, of baptism and communion. However, we do feel strongly that if we're going to cultivate biblical community, it has to go beyond Sunday morning. We have to get smaller, and we have to get a little more intentional. It's tough to do in an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. So I would encourage you, if you've not done so, to check out one of our community groups. I know my group has been so life-giving to me over the years. But the overarching question that I want to address this morning in part one of this piece of our vision is the why. So you'll notice there's three parts of our vision, six weeks. We're going to take two weeks on each part, and the pattern's pretty simple. Week one, we're going to talk about why we do it, and secondly, the second week, we'll talk about how we do it. Well, today, I want to talk about why. Why is biblical community so important with us? Now, I do want to say, <clears throat> by way of a disclaimer, that this morning and this series are a little bit out of the norm and the rhythm of our church, Okay. Uh, we don't do a lot of topical series here. We typically, the steady diet of preaching is going verse by verse through books of the Bible. Uh, this is what we would call a topical series. Uh, and this morning is really odd because typically I have one text that, that I'm going to set in and we'll maybe go somewhere else for references, but there'll be one central text. But today... We're going to be a, a little bit all over the place. So I tell you that to just tell you that if you like that, if that's the sort of sermon that you like, then you'll enjoy this morning. If you're like me and you're not a fan of that necessarily, this is not our norm, okay? Uh, but uh, we're going to jump off and talk about why biblical community is important by kind of doing a scan of the scriptures, okay? And just looking at some various points here, right? So with that in mind, let me just pray and then we'll jump into it. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the church that was bought and purchased by your blood. And God, we just want to listen this morning and hear the beauty about the family of God. And I ask that you will compel our hearts, God, to run toward it with, with excitement and zeal and passion. So Lord, speak through me, I pray. Lord, please don't let anything unbiblical come out of my mouth. And I pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Why? Is biblical community so important? Well, the first reason I want you to see this morning is this. That God's plan and purpose for all of creation, but especially mankind, is inseparably linked to the idea of living in community. All right? That's a mouthful. Let me say that again. God's plan for all of creation, but especially us, mankind, is inseparably linked to us living in community. We'll see this at the very beginning of the book, the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, and we'll dig into this when we go through the, the book in a few weeks, but in Genesis 1, the, the, the premise is simple, right? God creates everything out of nothing. With a word, the source of all life gives life. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the great artist puts an exclamation point on his masterpiece when he creates mankind, me and you. The biblical worldview is that God created everything, and he created us especially, not because he was bored, not because he needed us, but to declare his glory. That's why he created. We need to know that. We need to understand that. Psalm 119 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And whenever we see the beautiful stars in the sky, whenever we see a wonderful sunset, when we look at the beauty of creation, and it's beautiful, isn't it? We are not to admire and worship the creation itself. We are to remember there's a great God who made that. If that's great, how much greater is its maker? It is to declare his glory. Isaiah 43, 7 uh, says, everyone who is called by my name, this is God speaking, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created, what? For my glory. 
whom I formed and made. Friends, that is our purpose. That is our purpose. One of the questions that all humans who are introspective at all eventually ask is, why am I here? And I know a lot of times we're asking that to try to figure out what my career is or whatever it may be, but the Bible has an answer for that. Whether you agree with it or not, the Bible has an answer, and the answer is this. You are here to display the beauty and the glory of the one who made you. And this is what it means to be an image bearer. Genesis 1.26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man, how? In our image, after our likeness. And we were created, dear friends, in the image of God. Now, we are not God. That's been the great lie from the beginning, to worship ourselves, to become gods ourselves. We're not God. But we were created for the very purpose of reflecting God's glory here on planet Earth. Now, of course, sin has marred our image-bearing status. Every one of us have failed miserably to live this purpose out, particularly apart from Jesus. But this remains our purpose still. And the point that I'm making here in this part of our vision series is this. You can't live out that purpose apart from living in community. It's impossible. I mean, did you hear the way it was worded there in Genesis 1.26? This is a great mystery, isn't it? Let us make man in our image. Now, some of you may be confused. Wait a second. I thought Christianity was monotheistic. That sounds like a polytheistic statement there. Well, that is the beginning of a doctrine that we find all throughout the Scriptures. A great mystery to be sure that our God is one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can't explain it in a way that you'll understand. You can ask the Deity. He can probably explain it to you, all right? I can't. All right? I'm not even going to try to give you analogies because they all wind up in heresy one way or another. All right? One God in three persons. But this is what it tells us. That our God in his very, cre- in his very being is community. Our God is triune. He exists within himself in triune community. Uh, the Father eternally loving the Son. The Son eternally loving and serving the Father. The Spirit eternally loving and serving the Son and the Father. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Do you see that? Community is wired into our very created natures. In fact, do you know that the only thing that was deemed not good before sin entered the world was that man was alone? Right? We're created to live in this community. Tim Chester and Steve Timnus write in their book, Total Church, this. They said the Trinitarian understanding of our humanity suggests that we should define ourselves by the network of relationships in which we live. I am a father, husband, church member, child of God. This makes me unique. No one else shares the same matrix of relationships, but it also defines me in relation to other people. I am not autonomous. I am a person in community. I cannot be who I am without regard to other people. Into our pervasively individualistic worldview, we speak the gospel message of reconciliation, unity, and identity as the people of God. This is perhaps the most significant cultural gap the church has to bridge. I agree. Why do we need to live in community? Friends, because we can't be true to our created position as image bearers apart from it. And this applies to you whether you're an extroverted people who loves to be around people or an introverted person. It doesn't matter. We're wired for community. If nothing else, we were taught nothing else during COVID, it was that, wasn't it? All of us learned that. This is a little bit countercultural, though, within the church. I think sometimes we think about the height of spirituality being very individual, very intimate and personal, right? And we picture spirituality, the height of spirituality as, you know, some hipster guy on top of a mountain with nothing but a a cup of coffee from a third world country, his beard and his Bible. Just him and God, right, up on a mountain. That's really spiritual. And listen, I'm not downplaying those times, amen. I've been on top of mountains by myself, amen, just wonderful times with the Lord. And Jesus modeled getting along with the Lord, right? I'm not saying that we shouldn't have that time. I'm simply saying... And it's equally worshipful. It's equally God-honoring and God-imaging when we are with God's people, when we are together. In fact, there may be nothing more beautiful, nothing more beautiful than a group of people who have nothing in common except for Jesus. Coming together, loving each other, serving each other. So this idea is wrapped up in our very created natures. 
Secondly, notice this. That biblical community is important because God's plan for redemption has always been inseparably linked to the calling for a redeemed community. All right, so as I said, the fall in Genesis 3 jacked everything up. So if Genesis 1 tells us why we're here, Genesis 3 tells us why we're here in the state that we're in. This place is a hot mess, isn't it? Right? Why is there so much hate and and why is there so much injustice and racism and murder and betrayal and gossip and the like? Why is there sickness and death? It's here because of sin. Sin has shattered our creation. But the message of the Bible doesn't stop at Genesis 3, amen. It is a message of good news. God promised right there in Genesis 3, we'll dig into it later, he promises there that he is going to do battle against sin and death, and he is ultimately going to be victorious. And we know 2,000 years ago, he was. This is the message we call the gospel, where God came to us because we could never get to him. And Jesus was born, he lived the perfect life that Adam failed to live, that you and I have failed to live. And then he went and died a criminal's death on a cross. He took our place. He bore the very wrath of God of all who would trust him so that we could have life and have it forever. This plan to redeem broken man, though, we need to know, wasn't just a plan God came up with when, you know, Matthew came onto the scene. This was all throughout the Old Testament. This has always been God's plan to redeem the world to himself, to redeem sinners. And and what I want you to see this morning is this was never meant to be just an individual rescue mission. Now look at Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. Flip over there real quick. It's here in Genesis 12 that we have the account of God calling Abram. You, you guys probably know him better as Abraham, all right? And here's what it says. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you, circle it here, a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, of course, we know in biblical history that this was the birth of the nation of Israel. This was the first step in the birth of the nation of Israel, which is known intimately throughout the Scriptures as God's people. God's people. Now, I think we see right there in Genesis 12, there's clear indications that the intention was never for it just to be the people uh, of Israel, the Jews, right? Right? What does he say at the end of that promise to Abraham? All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. It was through the people of God that Jesus would come. And now all of us, Jew and Gentile, can have access to the favor of God through the Son, Jesus. Christianity was never a New Testament religion. It's always been tied together. And God's plan for salvation, which is a red line of redemption through the Old Testament leading to the cross, has always had, always had communal overtones. Do you see that? God called Abram. Not to be just an individual follower of him. He called him that he might become a nation, a people, to be a family for God's glory. It's right there in the very beginning of of kind of the the picture of this redeemed community. Listen to Exodus 19, 5 through 6. God says to Moses as he has given him the law. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So even as the law was being introduced, given to Moses up on Mount Sinai, God reminds them, I've called you to be a people for me. The apostle Peter picks up on this Old Testament principle, and he ties it to the church. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, what Lynn read to begin our time together, says, but you, he's talking to the church here, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Do you, do you hear here how God's redemption is tied not only to our relationship to Him, but to each other, to one another? Now listen to how Paul talks about uh, the purpose of Jesus' death, Titus chapter 2. 
He says, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce godly, ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the, our great God and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us. Do you hear the pronouns here? Us, our, us, our. To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself. Here it is a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. It's really popular for our modern culture to emphasize the personal aspect of our salvation. We like to ask the question, hey, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? And that's not a bad question, okay? I'm not poo-pooing on the question here, right? It's true, guys, that my faith is my faith. I chose to follow Jesus. And my faith isn't passed on to my kids. They have to choose that. My faith isn't passed on to my church members. You have to choose that. It's a personal uh, uh, decision to repent and put your faith in Jesus. And, and our faith is really personal. I can talk to God anytime, even when I'm abandoned by all those around me. Jesus doesn't abandon me. I can always call out to him. We have one high priest, Jesus Christ, whom we can go to God through. But I fear sometimes that our emphasis on the individual relationship with God downplays the beauty of the community of God. That our redemption has wrapped into it this idea of a family. So the implication is that our very salvation, while an individual decision can never, you see this, can never be separated from our commitment to one another in the body of Christ. I want you to hear the clear warning of what I'm saying here. Because I've heard people say things like this. If you say something silly like, I love Jesus, but I just, I don't like the church. Then, then you're missing the point of redemption. You're missing a huge part of the redemption of God. You need to maybe even reflect on your understanding of grace and what Christ has come to accomplish. Now listen to what Paul says in Romans 12, 4 through 5. He says, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and, I love this, because he gets both aspects here, and individually members of one another. Uh, Individually, we are members of one another. Some uh, even uh, translate that we belong to each other. That really drives home what Paul is getting at there. This idea that it isn't a mere casual uh, association. This is a committed relationship to one another. We are a group of individuals, but we are knit together. As I said earlier, this picture of the church being a body is so helpful because a severed body part isn't alive. It's not a part of the body. And Paul indicates here that you, you, if you can't really be united to the head without being united to the body. It's one and the same. If you are in Christ, you are in the body. So I know some of you are asking this question, maybe, if you're listening carefully. Hey, are, wait, so can I be a Christian and not be united to the church? Well, I think in a general way, we have to say yes, because maybe a ignorance or whatever, maybe a, a particular situation. We are saved through faith alone, by grace alone, and Christ alone, right? But I think Paul is very clearly saying this, that that would be abnormal. That would be unhealthy at best. Uh, Piper uses this text to warn us in a uh, message that he preached on that text in Romans. He says, think about the importance of this for your relationship to Christ. What would it mean if one lamb of the body said to the other limbs, I don't need you, I don't like you, so I choose not to be attached to you. I want no relationship with you. What would that mean? Well, that limb would be saying, I choose not to be in Christ. Can't have it both ways. Paul says, in Christ, we are individually members of one another. That's a reality. We don't make it a reality. It is a reality. And if we reject that reality, we reject Christ. In other words, the reality of the church, the local body, is crucial. So I want us to hear that. Why is cultivating biblical community important? In a lot of ways, it is synonymous with being in Christ. So two things so far. Why is it important? Well, it's important to our created purpose. 
as image bearers of God. It is important to our redemptive purpose as those who've been saved by the grace of God. Thirdly, last one here, God's plan, it, the community, biblical community is important because God's plan for our spiritual growth and our spiritual health is inseparably linked to the idea of living in community with other believers. Now, this is the more tangible, practical portion of the sermon. Bottom line, to summarize that, we need each other. And God has designed us specifically, he's designed the church as a tool to keep us healthy. A tool for our sanctification. Listen to the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. He writes, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another. To love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what's the context here? Well, the context is an exhortation to live in confident, obedient relationship with God, not wavering, not throwing in the towel, not giving up, not stepping off the course, not stepping away from the faith as so many in our culture are doing right now. And he tells us that one amazing gift that God has given to help us not waver is the body of Christ. It is the church. We need our biblical community. We need it because there is an enemy out there. His name is Satan. The Bible tells us he is like a roaring lion roaming the earth seeking someone to devour. We talked about this, Alethea, when we went through Ephesians chapter 6. There is spiritual warfare and he is spitting out all these lies to tempt us. Our hearts are sick with sin. And, and the church serves as a guard. It's a tool in the hand of God to guard us. There are times when I believe lies. I, I'm a pastor. I believe lies from the enemy all the time. And I need my brothers and sisters in Christ, empowered by the Spirit, equipped with the Word of God, to speak truth to me. I need it. Notice with me all the ways we need each other for our health and growth. We need, first of all, accountability. And that's found in a community. We need accountability. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I love that. Confess your sins to who? To each other. Let's be open and honest and transparent about our struggles. And if we see someone who maybe is ignorant in their sin or they're resisting, we in love must go after them. Why? So you may be healed. That's the implication there in James. Proverbs 27, 17, I love this verse. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. True biblical community, listen to this, true biblical community loves your holiness, it loves your spiritual health more than it loves your sensibilities. And it would actually call out your sin because it loves you. That's really countercultural. We need that. We need a body that will do that. Secondly, we need restoration when we fall. I mean, the reality is this. Now, we're all going to be tempted, and some of us are going to fall every day, probably. We struggle. Galatians 6.1 tells us this, though. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So, yes, we need sin called out in our life, in love, of course, with the Scripture. It's a community project to call out sin, but it's even more a community project to restore those caught in it. Trapped in it, maybe broken by it. We've seen some beautiful pictures of restoration in our 10 year history at Alathe. We really can. I can tell you some amazing stories. And maybe you'll hear some of those at our, our anniversary party. I don't know. But God is good, and we need that. We need each other to restore us when we fall. Third, we need encouragement when we're discouraged. Uh, the writer of Hebrews specifically tells us, tells, tells us to do what? Encourage one another, I love it, all the more as we see the day drawing near. Now, what day is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the day of the Lord's return. He's coming back. We don't know. It could be today. It could be a thousand years from now. We do not know, but a day is coming where he's going to return. But between now and then, life's hard, isn't it? Man, being a Christian is dang hard. And if somebody's spinning these lies to you that following Christ is easy, just know that's probably setting you up for failure. 
It's hard. When Jesus said, follow me, what did he say? Did he say, follow me to the comfort room. We'll sit on a couch and watch TV together. No. He says, if any man wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself. Take up his cross. That's an instrument of death. And follow me. It's hard. We live in a world that hates the light of Christ. And if you're going to be the light of Christ, if you're going to love Christ and honor him with your life, with your words, with your actions, Well, the world is going to persecute you. And Jesus says, don't get caught off guard by that. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And indeed, when they persecute you, they're persecuting me. It's going to come. Expect it. And when it happens, and it will, maybe some of you experience it now at school or at work or in some other scenario. When it happens, oh my gosh, it's so discouraging, isn't it? But we have each other. We have the gift of one another. It can be discouraging to be on mission together, but we have one another to encourage each other in those times of discouragement. We encourage one another by pointing each other to the truths of the gospel, to the promises. Oh, how many beautiful, precious promises do we have from God that we forget in our discouragement, and we encourage each other by reminding each other of our promises. I can't tell you the amount of times that I have heard students who are just thriving in the relationship with Jesus Christ at school, being a part of the church, and then they go home, and a lot of them didn't grow up in Christian families, and so now they're in a house where there's no Christians, and they don't have a good biblical community maybe where they live, and they get really discouraged. And they go, man, I'm glad to be back here. Look, that's no accident, because we're, we're not designed to do this alone. We're not made to do this alone. You show me a Christian who begins to detach themselves from the church, and I will show you someone who very soon will probably walk away from Christ altogether. I've seen it time and time again. Sometimes it's like some willful rebellion. Other times it's just they let life take precedent over biblical community. Maybe you get a job and they work every Sunday, and next thing you know, they're gone. Or maybe, you know, they just travel so much and they're just never able to dig into their biblical community. And next thing you know, their affections for Jesus are so faint. It's like he's not even there. Look, we need each other. We need encouragement. You can't get it unless we're here. Unless we're committed. Unless we're cultivating biblical community. Let's look at a couple more. We need help bearing one another's burdens. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And that, of course, would be, include the personal burden of personal sin. But it's more than that, isn't it? So much more than that. It's just life. Life is hard. Right? We should bear one another burdens. We've had some babies born in our church recently. Amen? Praise God for that. But let me just tell you, they're little cuties, right? But they're work. And... I think it's a beautiful thing when the church comes alongside of new parents, makes some meals so they can figure out how to be new parents who maybe will come over even in the middle of the night and hold the baby for a little while so mom and dad can get some sleep. That's, that, that's all part of what we can do as a church, and we ought to. Now, I, I'm a dad. I got three kids, my, three kids in three different schools, and I pastor a church and you know, all kinds of things. I can't sometimes juggle life. And if I just see my biblical community as one more thing to juggle and not invite into the rest of it, I'm probably going to drop it. We belong to each other. We serve each other. We bear one another's burdens. My burden is your burden. Your burden is my burden. And to withhold that or deny that is either driven by our misunderstanding or maybe it's just simply pride. One more. We need teaching from one another. Yes, of course, we get that teaching from the leaders of the church. Um, we, one of the things we commit in our, our covenant with new members is that we're going to teach you from the Word of God. And our pastors are going to work hard to teach you from the Word of God. But it's not just pastors. It's not even just community group leaders. It's one another. Listen to Colossians 3.16. It says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. I I love that. Let us teach one another. You know, when you are reading God's Word, 
maybe one morning in your quiet time and the Lord speaks to you. Can I just encourage you? Share that with somebody. I love that. And periodically, somebody will text me and go, man, I was reading this this morning. The Lord encouraged me. I just want to encourage you with it. Amen. It's teaching me. Or how, how else are they teaching one another in there? By singing psalms and hymns. That's, you know, we have speakers and stuff, but we don't crank it to 10 in here because I want to hear you singing. You're teaching me. We're teaching one another as we sing songs. As you're reminded of why you should be thankful, remind me why I ought to be thankful as a Christian. This is a community project. The list could go on and on about the reasons and the benefits and the needs for being in biblical community. But the bottom line is we need each other. It is right. It is good. We're designed for it. And the church is a tool for our sanctification. So where does this leave you this morning? Well, hopefully it relieves you with a renewed passion for the family of God. That's my prayer. And sometimes we may wonder, not why should I make my bed in the morning. Some of you may be wondering, why should I get up if out of bed on a Sunday morning and come to church? Or why would I ever go through the work of coming home from a hard day at work, getting together, and then going to a community group? That seems like so much work. I'd rather kick off my shoes and watch Netflix or whatever. Or why is it crucial that I just don't disappear for long periods of time? My prayer is you'll walk away today with a little more understanding, with no doubts as to the importance of biblical community and why we encourage and challenge you to do it and cultivate it. For my friends here who don't know Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. I've already explained the gospel once, but I'll remind you of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your sin, just like mine, has left you guilty before a holy God. But Christ came, he laid down his life for you so that you could live forever. Have your sins forgiven. Have a relationship with him. And as we've said today again and again, you can have a family. Some of you got crappy families at home. You can have a family united by something thicker than our blood. United by the blood of Christ. And we would call you today to follow Jesus. Repent and believe. And we'd love to pray with you. For my brother and sister in the room today who maybe, maybe you've neglected community or you're neglecting it currently with your lack of presence or with your lack of commitment, I pray in love the Lord presses you this morning. God's got so much in store for you. And it involves living in light of your created nature and your redeemed calling. You need the body of Christ. And friend, we need you. Would you repent of that indifference? And would you run toward your family, not away from it? For those of you who are not neglecting, maybe you may be asking, how can I live more in light of this calling to cultivate? How do I cultivate it? Well, stay tuned. That's what we're going to talk about next Sunday. Come back. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the how. But for now, uh, I don't know. Maybe take somebody out to lunch today or have them back to your house for lunch. All right? I know some people, I know Dana's have some people over for a barbecue. We're going to have some people. Like, cultivate biblical community. It's not, it's not rocket science. Invite people into your lives. Invite them into your lives. Go be the church. I don't know how God is calling you to respond today, but I pray that you will. Let's pray together. Thank you so much, God, for creating us. We have breath in our lungs because you are good because you are powerful. Our bodies, our lives are sustained because you are God, we are not. And you made us to glorify you. And I pray that we will glorify you as individuals, but Lord, more so as those who live in community, as those who seek to cultivate life together. God, it is such a crying shame to me, God, and there are so many people missing out on the beauty of the church. It is as if we are trading in a steak dinner for some fast food meal. God, forgive us. I pray, Lord Jesus, you will press us hard, Lord Jesus, to live as if we belong to one another. Please, God. Lord, if someone's in this room today and they don't belong to the body of Christ because they're not a Christian... Oh, God, I beg of you, I plead, would you save them today? And would you bring them in maybe to this family 
or another church family. Maybe they don't live around here, but to another church family where they can, they can begin to enjoy Christ with other believers, to glorify God with other believers in committed relationship. God, we pray that you would do these things and do them all so that you may be lifted up on high and exalted. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.